situation and rush composition. All right, thank you. Um, so the, the title of this workshop is like online and matching based market design. And I guess in English, and can be ambiguous, you know, is it like the union or the intersection? But I was gratified to see that many of the talks didn't have an online component. And so I feel less guilty about giving a talk that doesn't have a stable matching component. My slides are no longer appearing. <laughs> I have my own cable if we think this is a cable issue. Okay. Um, and this is joint work with uh, a bunch of students, George and Ramya and Stephen. And, and Stephen is an undergrad applying for PhD programs. So look for him in your pod. Oh, no. Here, I've got this other cable. Maybe that one will more friendly. Okay. So I want to think about a basic question, which is, um, you know, when is it a good idea for a, a decision maker who wants to maximize their utility to act as if predictions about the future are correct, and when should they do something more complicated in strategizing? And to formalize that, I, I, here's a you know simple model. I've got a decision maker that's got some set of actions. And the other thing that's relevant to their utility is some state, which I'll think about representing as a vector. This could be something exogenous, or it could be um, some um, aggregation of what, what other players have done. So this could be a utility function in a, in a game. Um, and so these states, they're vectors. I'm going to assume that this utility function is uh, linear and Lipschitz in the state. And just to sort of say a couple words about that, it, it's, you, know, you sort of worry, I say, oh, linear, this might be like a really limited setting. Um, it's actually quite general. So for example, your utility function could be arbitrary, and the state could just tell you uh, in each coordinate what your payoff is for playing each of your actions. That would be linear. Uh, you could have some, there could be sort of some D distinct outcomes that will be realized in the future. You don't know what they are. Maybe the, the, the state is the probability distribution over those outcomes. Your expected utility is linear by linearity of expectation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about routing games. Maybe you know, we've got um, you know, a road network, and there's going to be some traffic on each road, and you're going to pick a path. And your utility, you, know, you care about your commute time. Your utility is the sum of the congestions on the roads. That's linear. It could be an online added matching on the, on the plane in case. Uh, this was like important. It could be an online max weight matching problem, right? Maybe the state tells you what is the weight of the edges. Um, you know, the, the weight of a matching is the sum of those things. That's linear. Um, there are ways to represent extensive form games in this way. We'll talk about that a little bit. So, so um, this is all to say this is a pretty general setup. You shouldn't be scared of the word linear here. OK. So what should you do? Well, if you, if you knew what the state of the world is, if you knew what this vector s was, uh, it's clear what you should do. You should best respond. You should choose the action that maximizes your utility given the state of the world. Uh, the difficulty that I want to think about is, is the fact that you've got to act before the state is known. Right? Somehow we need to like predict the state and, and use that to act. So for example, um, you know, I, I typed into Google Maps. Um, I asked it for. Uh, traffic report in Philadelphia, not now, but next Monday. OK, so this is a projection into the future of what Google thinks the traffic will look like uh, on Monday. Right? So it's, it's, it's not correct, necessarily. It's a prediction. Um, is it a good idea 
for me to like plan my route out now as if this is the traffic, or should I spend a long time studying the kinds of prediction algorithms Google's using and hope to come up with a more clever strategy as a function of, of this information I've been given? Okay, so let me tell you about calibration. Maybe the way you've, if you've heard about calibration before, the way you've heard about it is probably you know, predicting like binary outcomes. Like you can talk about weather forecasters and whether they're calibrated. So the traditional story is a weather forecaster says something like there's a 20% chance of rain tomorrow. And the way you want to check if he's calibrated is you look at all of the days for which he's predicted a 20% chance of rain and you verify that it's rained on 20% of those days. But you can talk about calibration when you're predicting a real valued vector instead of just a binary outcome, what's the more general definition? It's just that the forecasts should be statistically unbiased, not just marginally, but conditional on the forecast itself. Okay, so conditional on predicting a 20% chance of rain, the probability of rain should be 20%. But more generally, I could say conditional on predicting some vector of road congestions in the city of Philadelphia, the expected value of those road congestions should be that big vector. That's a bigger ask, but in principle, you could define this thing. And it, it's, it's sort of a classical idea is that it is a good idea to follow calibrated forecasts. If the forecasts are calibrated, you should follow them. Okay, well, what does that mean? How do you formalize that? Well, okay. you know, maybe you've got some extra information that the forecaster doesn't have. The statement I'm about to tell you doesn't apply in that case. Okay, this is about if the only information you have is what the forecaster is telling you. And so the kind of action, the kind of object you are coming up with when you're deciding how to act is a policy which maps predictions to actions. Okay, there's a lot of such policies. You could try to come up with sort of complicated ones that exploit problems in the system. But something that if this was a longer talk, I would prove for you, it's only four lines, it follows almost directly from the definition, is that if the forecasts are calibrated, then it is a dominant strategy amongst all policies to treat the forecasts as correct and to best respond to them, to act straightforwardly, to just best respond to the predictions as if they were correct. This follows from calibration and the fact that your utility function is linear in the state. Okay, so, so that's great. Calibration has some good news, but it's also got some bad news. So, okay, the good news, calibrated predictions incentivize agents in a very strong sense to um, treat them as correct. They can be used straightforwardly and transparently. You don't have to try to like game the system. And the other piece of good news is, is that it's actually feasible to come up with uh, calibrated forecasts, at least in principle. We've known since Foster and Vora that there are algorithms that can interact in a sort of online sequential environment and, and come up with forecasts that are guaranteed to be calibrated in hindsight, even if the sequence is chosen adversarially. So you don't need the sequence to have any nice properties at all. By the way, I, I talked about calibration by writing down like an expectation. What does an expectation even mean if there's no distribution? What calibrated in hindsight means is that the expectation is over a random choice of day. If I pick a, yeah, well, you, you play out everything, now there's an empirical distribution over the time steps. The distributions pick a random time step. Okay. But there's some bad news too. Um, two pieces of bad news, really. So calibrated forecasts are not necessarily useful. Even constant predictors could be calibrated if they happen to predict the mean outcome. Okay, so, so this sort of statement I made to you about it being a dominant strategy to like faithfully follow a calibrated forecast, you know, it's like a little bit sneaky, which is that if I'm making complicated forecasts, the set of policies mapping forecast to actions is complicated, and this is a strong statement, but one way to sort of, you know, game the statement is to make very simple forecasts, always forecast the same thing, and then the set of policies mapping forecasts to actions is just the constant set of policies, and uh, it's not a, not a super, you know, useful thing. Um, and, you know, like, actually making these sort of constant forecasts, it doesn't really make sense in an online setting. Like, that would make sense in a distributional setting, but, like, for a constant forecast to be calibrated, you need to predict the mean, and you don't know what the mean is. There is no well-defined mean in an online setting, and so, you know, like, maybe if you think calibration's too easy, actually, bad news, um, 
the, both the statistical and uh, computational complexity of maintaining d-dimensional forecasts grows exponentially with d. So this means you know, the running time grows exponentially with d, and your, if you measure your distance from calibration, that'll you know, go to zero eventually, but at a rate that is exponentially slow in the dimension. So calibrating, yeah. So calibration is something that is feasible in a one-dimensional binary setting uh, and makes sense to define in a high-dimensional setting, but is not really feasible in a high-dimensional setting. Yeah. So look, if I'm a Bayesian decision maker and I have a prior about traffic in Philadelphia or Monday, <laughs> I never want to be calibrated. I want to shrink the signal towards my prior mean. Your, your posterior belief will always be calibrated if, if your model is well specified. But I'm not talking about um, distributional settings. Okay. Um, okay. So, you, you know, like, so what do we do? So in high dimensional settings, I want to ask, is there something short of calibration we can ask for uh, that still makes it a good idea in some sense for agents to treat the forecasts as correct? and you know, can we obtain it efficiently? Like we want these good properties, uh, but we want um, even in even in adversarial settings for us to be able to, you know, have both running time that is polynomial in the relevant parameters of the problem and bounds that go to zero at this polynomial rate. And uh, does thinking about this question lead us to new learning algorithms? New learning algorithms, say, in games with large action spaces. That seems like sort of a specific question to ask. So I might have reverse engineered this slide. So what's the online prediction setting? Well, there's a context space X. Um, so every day you might learn some features relevant to the prediction task, right? If I'm a weather forecaster, maybe I get like some meteorological observations, other stuff. And there's some um, pr convex prediction uh, space. So maybe, you know, if there's like D outcomes I'm forecasting, um, my, the, th the kinds of things I can predict are probability distributions over those D outcomes. That's convex. Maybe if I'm predicting traffic on the road network in Philadelphia, um, you know, okay, maybe I can just, you know, maybe it's like just a rectangle. Maybe I can predict any traffic on any road, or maybe I even want it to obey flow constraints. Those are convex sets. Um, and then what's going to happen is in rounds, the learner is going to first observe the context, whatever features are relevant to the prediction task. Then the learner produces some prediction, uh, congestion on the road network, a probability distribution over outcomes. Uh, and then the learner finally gets to observe the outcome. Eventually, I see you know, what is the weather. I get to measure the road congestions, but like only after the decisions have been made. OK. And so, OK, so that's the setting. And um, let me tell you a thing that you might ask for in this setting. That won't, it won't be immediately clear why this is a good thing to ask for, but it's you know, some like, basic computational primitive you can ask for, and it'll turn out to be useful. So let's say that an event is just some like, function that maps maybe the features that are available at some time step t and the prediction that I make at time step t to like, an, to like an indicator, zero or one. Is today, you know, is the event active today or not as a function of what I predicted and what else I knew that day? And it could be more complicated if you wanted, but that's not important for this talk. And so maybe what I could want to do is, given some collection of events, I might want to promise that my forecasts are unbiased, they have no statistical bias, which means that if I sum up over my forecasts, that should average out to what I would get if I summed up over the outcome. I don't have to get it right day by day, but I, I should get it right on average. And maybe I don't want that to be the case just marginally, asking for that really to be the case just on average. That would be you know, too easy. Uh, maybe I want it to be the case conditional on each of these events. So if I sum up just over the subsequences defined by when these events are active, I should also want it to be the case that the sum of my predictions averages out to the sum of the outcomes. Okay. So calibration is a special case of this. You can instantiate this condition as calibration if 
my events correspond to the indicator that I have made each of the possible different predictions. I want to be unbiased, conditional on the predictions I've made. Uh, but the problem with calibration is there's, you know, exp you know, in D dimensions, there's exponentially many predictions I can make and therefore exponentially many conditioning events. Okay. Um, so, like, why is calibration hard is it in D dimensions? Is it because there's exponentially many predictions I can make? The, my action space is exponentially large? Or is it only because the number of constraints I need to satisfy is exponentially large? Right, so suppose I ask for D-dimensional predictions. There's still two to the D of them. Um, but I only want them to be unbiased, uh, subject to like a polynomial number of conditioning events. Now, is the problem easy? Can I solve that in polynomial time? And, um, oh, I did this in the reverse direction. Can I solve that in polynomial time? And is that good for anything? Like, you know, what did I want to do with these predictions? Like, you know, are there, if I can do this in polynomial time, are there polynomial, poly polynomially sized collections of events that are the ones that are relevant for your downstream decision task? Maybe you only cared about polynomially many of the events. So let me talk about online combinatorial optimization, which is going to capture, you know, this will generalize this sort of driving through Philadelphia thing. It's also, you know, like an you could phrase online max weight matching in this way. So suppose I've got some collection of D base actions. Okay. So in the, in the driving through Philadelphia example, the base actions are like the roads in this network, the edges in the graph. If I write down the network as a graph. Now, I've got some feasible set of actions, which are, you know, each action is a subset of these base actions. Okay. So, like, maybe I'm going to pick a path from my home to my office that is a subset of the edges. Not every subset of edges forms a path. I'm only allowed to play paths. And what's the state? Um, well, the state tells me something that I care about um, for each edge. Okay. So maybe it's just the, you know, commute time along that edge, how long it's going to take me to drive. But I could have other preferences as well. Maybe I have preferences for, you know, non-tall roads or, or roads that drive by the water. Or, you know, maybe I like traffic. Who knows? Okay, so I have, there's some gain or loss, if you like, that um, accrues to each edge. And the relevant thing here is that the utility for an action, like a path, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be linearly separable across the base actions. It's the sum of my gains or losses along these edges. Okay, so this is the linear aspect of it. <coughs> okay, so it, it's this game, or you know, so far it's just a decision problem. It's got a lot of actions, two to the D actions potentially, like there could be a lot of paths in a graph, uh, but it's got this lower dimensional, you know, D dimensional linear structure. Okay, so there's, you know, I might hope to be able to uh, predict, like what are the congestions in, on the roads. Okay. And if you if you sort of have heard of you know no regret algorithms in their simplest form, expert learning, this also generalizes that where your actions are just identically the base actions. Yeah. Just trying to distinguish the model from the example. Uh, oh, so, so um, yes. Yeah, so, okay, but like. No, go. Hey, I want to see the model. Uh, okay. So U is, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, this S is not the same as this S. Uh, What's an action? So, so, so in the example of online shortest paths, an action is like a path in the graph from some source to some destination. That happens to be a path is a set of edges. More generally, in the general problem, there's some base actions. Those are you know, the analogs of the road. And your real actions can be collections of subsets of those. That's why there's potentially two to the D, many of them. And I'm, I'm not imposing, at the moment, any structure on what those subsets look like. So, so far, we were just talking at the beginning of your talk, in which you were just linear in the state. Everything's going to be linear in the state the whole time. Yeah. Okay. So online shortest paths. Um, also, online max weight matching. Maybe every day, I, it doesn't have to be a bipartite graph, actually, right? Like maybe every day, 
the thing I do is pick a, a matching in this graph. It's a subset of edges that satisfy the matching constraints. And what I care about is the sum of the edge weights. Okay. So um, suppose I've got um, a collection of let's call them now subsequence indicator functions, but they look a whole lot like these events I was talking about. Okay, that now, rather than as a function of the predictions, as a function of external context and the action you play, right now you're acting in the game, tell you if today's round is part of a subsequence that I care about or not. So I can talk about subsequence regret, which means that if I look at the cumulative utility that I obtained, not overall, but on the rounds for which this subsequence was active, that should be at least as large as the utility I would have gotten had I consistently played the best fixed action on that subsequence. But I might have a collection, a big collection of such events, and I want this to hold simultaneously across all of them, even though each day can belong to multiple subsequences. And it should be max. Um, depending on whether you're trying to maximize your utility or minimize your cost. Oh. Um, so let's define some maybe interesting events. Let's say your utility function is u, and I'm going to define an event for each of the base actions, for each of like the road net, for, for each of the roads in the network. It is the event that when you best respond to um, my predictions, the road that you take uh, includes a the path that you take includes a particular road. Okay, so if there's d edges in this graph, I've just defined d such events. I can aggregate all of the events that correspond to your utility function. That's d events. And maybe there's other, you know, these subsequences I care about. Maybe I care about, you know, like having low commute time, not just on average, but like, you know, after the, you know, on days after a, a Phillies game when it's raining and I decide to take a toll road. Okay. Yeah. Is the event a function of what? Or the actions or the spin? The event can be a, a function of external context, like if it's raining, and also the um, prediction. And if you are best responding to my predictions, therefore the action that you take. Okay. So, theorem um, for any collection of events that you care about, um, if the forecasts that I make, happen to have low bias on the Cartesian product of these events that you care about, like say in the routing game, um, together with these events defined by your utility function that your best response to my forecasts chooses to take each of these roads, then you'll actually have a low subsequence regret in hindsight in this game. So uh, this requires, you know, if you had a polynomial number of events, like only a polynomial number of subsequences you cared about, only a small number of, uh, you know, only a polynomial number of um, conditioning events. And we can ask for this simultaneously um, for many different agents. Okay. It's not just for one utility function. I could ask for it to hold simultaneously for M players with M utility functions. Okay, so for example, uh, what can I? What, what could I do with that if I could make these low bias predictions? <laughs> I could publish a single set of traffic reports that are a good idea to follow in this no regret sense, um, simultaneously for a whole bunch of agents who might correspond to different source destination pairs in this graph, who might have different utility functions in terms of what their disutility for traffic is, how much they care about tolls, everything else. Uh, and they'd have no regret, not just overall, but on rainy days, on Mondays, on national holidays, on days when the best route involves I-76, or whatever polynomial collection of events you care about. One other application. Um, I can publish forecasts. Um, it, suppose I'm in a setting where you know, there's only polynomially many actions, maybe. And maybe also the type space is only polynomially large. OK. And then I can sort of calibrate in this way with polynomially many events to all of the actions and all of the types simultaneously. So for example, uh, first price auctions are kind of like this, right? Your type is like a one-dimensional value. It's also your bid space. And so I could publish forecasts 
oh, and you know, like normally, how would you bid in the first price auction? Like you might need to like have some, you know, common prior if you wanted to play a Bayes Nash equilibrium, but where do you get that from? So I could publish forecasts of, um, you know, like what the distribution on the highest bid other than your own was going to be. And I need to know what your valuation is. I can promise no matter what your valuation is, if you best respond to these forecasts, you'll have no swap regret, not just overall, but also conditional on properties of the item, like user demographics of an ad impression, also conditional on the history of bids, like the day after you've been outbid, or any other polynomial collection of events that, that you care about as a function of the history, the context, and your own action. Okay. Um, I'm out of time, so you know you can represent extensive form games as special cases of online combinatorial optimization. I, I won't tell you how, but you know it's kind of neat. This gives you new learning algorithms for uh, extensive form games, which are another setting with a large action space. Um, and you know, like this would have been kind of like disappointing if I told you all of these things you could do with these predictions, but then you couldn't make these predictions. So I, you know, I won't tell you how you make these predictions, but let me show you the theorem. Uh, you can do it. So for any set of, for any polynomial collection of events, um, there, there is an online prediction algorithm that can make these d-dimensional forecasts, um, even in an adversarial setting. Okay, the state can be adversarially chosen, so that your worst case bias with respect to these events is you know grows at most with root t and at most with the log of the number of events. So information theoretically, you can have a ton of events. The running time is, is polynomial in the number of events. So you know, unless you have a fast computer, you don't want that many of them. OK, so calibration, great. Incentivizes downstream agents to treat predictions as correct, but it's got this terrible computational complexity. Um, but the complexity does not come from the fact that the action space is enormous. It comes from the fact that it requires satisfying exponentially many constraints. And if you only have polynomially many events you want to be unbiased with respect to, you can solve this problem efficiently. And for many downstream problems, I only told you some of them, the paper has a lot of them. For many downstream problems, actually polynomially many events are enough. That's what's a useful algorithm design paradigm. If, you, if you're designing an algorithm, there's only one utility function, yours. Make predictions that are good for your utility function and then best respond to them. But you can do this for more than one utility function. So you can also think about it as a way of designing coordination mechanisms, a single set of forecasts that incentivize uh, many agents with different utility functions to best respond to them. Um, and, and there's a you know concrete mechanism design application in contract theory that I don't have time to tell you about. Um, there's, a, there's a whole other collection of applications that I definitely don't have time to tell you about because they don't relate to anything I've talked about at all, but are about uncertainty quantification, producing prediction sets in machine learning. And if you've ever heard of conformal prediction, which the, at this workshop there's no reason you should have, but it's some general family of techniques for affixing arbitrary machine learning algorithms with prediction sets, which can be subsets of the labels they're predicting. Okay, when you hear the word subset, you should worry, oh, there's exponentially many of these. And the way the conformal prediction literature solves this problem is it sort of makes an, a very important choice early on to project this exponentially large space onto like a one-dimensional laminar family. And then it's like a one-dimensional optimization problem. You can solve it, but you've really like lost a lot of information by projecting things down to one dimension. Well, using these tools, you don't have to do that anymore. You don't have to um, reduce things to one dimension. You can directly calibrate the class probabilities to you know, not full calibration, but to the task at hand. OK, so thank you. Uh, all credit is due to my co-authors, and the paper is on archive as of uh, yesterday. Thank you.